glad to have you here for the third part of our lecture. In the third part of this lecture, we will talk about frameworks and plugins. There are other terms for this, like black box frameworks, add-ons, um, and things like that. We will talk about this technique, and it's another technique where we uh, be, will be able to provide compile time variability in terms of a product line, and we will have some modularity principles, some modularity, some interfaces between our features. And we will see that in some extent, uh, frameworks with plugins provide us some advantages over components, um, but it also comes with some uh, drawbacks as we see later on, and this is very common to this lecture. We have a bunch of uh, different implementation techniques and all have their uh, benefits and drawbacks, but still this is my uh, favorite technique. So you might want to uh, see that I'm a bit biased uh, towards this technique. So frameworks with plugins is probably the most, uh, yeah, uh, has the, the best properties in terms of software engineering perspective. Uh, but still frameworks uh, cannot be applied in all the situations and we will come to this at the end of the part. So again, we will talk about what is a framework with plugin and afterwards we will talk about how can frameworks with plugins be used for product lines. A framework is a set of classes that embodies an abstract design for solutions to a family of related problems and supports reuse at a larger granularity than classes. The framework is open for extensions at explicit hotspots or also called extension points. So a framework is basically, uh, we have is typically built on the principle of object orientation on top of that. And a framework provides several object oriented classes and those classes together sum up to something that is more than just a typical software system. It's, it's not just a software system, but it's a particular software system, a software system that provides hotspots. Or extension points, extension points allow us to provide different extensions later on. So what is a plugin? A plugin extends hotspots of a framework with custom behavior. A plugin can be separately compiled and deployed. So I can actually, for a certain framework, I can buy a plugin from a certain vendor, plug it into my system and let it run, and then uh, we'll have a different behavior overall. So this is quite close already to the idea uh, that we have with product lines, right? We can have some customizations, uh, but we are not only talking about like user customizations, we're only talking about variability in a sense that sometimes we need certain functionality and sometimes not. So the term framework is a bit overloaded. So there are many software systems that are called frameworks because it's a very nice word and it sounds like something that is more than just a software system. Um, so there's a more specific term uh, for these frameworks that with plugins uh, and they are typically called black box frameworks. So, and the principle behind this is that if you develop a plugin for a framework, you do not need to look into the source code in order to implement your plugin. You can uh, compile an, uh, your plugin uh, separately of the framework uh, and you do not need to look into the framework. Still, there are black box frameworks out there like Eclipse, for instance, we will see this later on in more detail, where we have access to the source code. But it's a different mindset whether we have to look into the source code in order to understand this. This is what is known as white box framework and not so much considered in this lecture because it's very similar to what we talked about um, components in the first part. So the basic principle behind frameworks and plugins is inversion of control. And this is also known as the Hollywood principle. Don't call us, we call you. So. Hollywood, we have characters, we have people uh, that uh, play in movies, and it's typically not that they say, I want to be in that movie, uh, but it's rather that they say, I'm available, um, and if there's a, a movie where I fit, then you will be uh, called and uh, people will uh, use uh, or ask you uh, to act uh, in a certain uh, role of a movie. 
So that's the Hollywood principle. So what does it mean for our software world? And uh, Timo Kira did a great uh, picture over here, which helps us to explain this. So what we talked about in the first part of the lecture is that of components, or another word is a library, right? So you have certain libraries out there, then you write your code and you can call a library. And in most cases, we typically call more than one library. And we have this glue code to connect our code to the library. So this is different with frameworks because the code, the extensions that we provide, uh, we don't call the uh, components, but the framework is basically calling our uh, source code. So whenever we provide a new plugin, uh, we cannot say, uh, I'm, I'm calling, uh, I, I will be executed at this point in time, but the framework decides when the code of the plugin will be executed or not. And this is why also many frameworks have some kind of initialization of plugins, where plugins can say, whenever I have a file with a certain ending is opened, uh, then I want to get a notification of this uh, that uh, the plugin can react on something. So, and this can be understand in terms of design patterns, uh, although it's uh, a larger, uh, archi more architectural pattern uh, framework with plugins, and it can be understood in terms of the observer or strategy patterns. So the framework exposes explicit hotspots at which plugins can register observers and strategies, and it requires plea planning for possible future extensions. So while designing the framework, I, to some extent, already need to envision what are the potential plugins and what will the be extension points or hotspots needed by those plugins later on in order that they be, will be able to provide their extensions. So this requires pre-planning and it also requires a certain expertise from developers because if you have, have never developed the database, uh, then you will not be able to uh, implement a database framework uh, where you can envision what, what are potential plugins in this domain. So what is more common and uh, frequent in industry is that people have built databases for many years, people have built integrated development environments uh, for many years, and once they are expert, they know the domain, they know what are the potential plugins that we can expect, what are the features in this um, domain, uh, then they will be, uh, they might be able to uh, implement a framework from scratch where they design all these hotspots uh, in advance. So this requires pre-planning, but also a lot of expertise uh, to create those frameworks. So before we look into source code, I would like to uh, guide you through uh, some real-world examples. Um, when it comes to frameworks, I thought of uh, an example uh, when the new bicycle for my daughter arrived. Uh, and then I thought, oh, that's actually a very similar principle than uh, what we do with frameworks and plugins. So what are possible extensions if we want, uh, if we bought uh, by a bike, then we have certain extensions. We have a bike lock. We might have a front wheel brake. We might have a wheel uh, wheel brake. And you might already see from those examples. So not every uh, bicycle uh, has the same bike lock, or um, uh, might in some areas that you might not need a bike lock. Even uh, I've heard that in Canada. Uh, there are areas where people do not need to lock their houses. Uh, actually, that's, that sounds very, very interesting. And I would uh, love to live in an area where this is uh, feasible. Uh, and uh, there are different uh, like uh, brakes, different front brakes. And in some cases, you don't need a wheel brake uh, or don't need this kind of wheel brake because you not have another one or there, uh, there might be a kickstand. And for all these examples, I've chosen those examples of bike extensions because they have, they, uh, they required some pre-planning, right? So the people that have built the frame, they have not built the, the first frame of, of their life, but they've probably built the frame in a way with a lot of experience and with some expert knowledge. And they know that there's a standardized version of brakes uh, uh, and there are actually 
several standardized version, but there's one that uh, uses uh, this uh, particular uh, combination over here, where we uh, like where the where we stop the wheel over here, but there are other ones where we stop the wheel over here. Sorry, I don't know the uh, English terms. So you see, there's some pre-planning involved in this. And uh, for instance, for this kickstand, there is something that is actually plan in, planned. Uh, you cannot uh, put every kickstand on this uh, bike, but you can only put certain kickstands over here. So there's a framework with extension points over here. So and actually uh, a bicycle that's even from the wording, right? So we have a frame over there, but it's not just the frame because the frame already has some pre-built extension points that we can use, uh, and then we have some plugins, and those plugins might use certain extension points and provide extensions to this. So uh, in this case. Um, a new part and we can plug this in to the framework and then have a customized variant of the system. And um, the basic story behind this is that you see that it would be a lot more effort uh, to, um, to fix this, uh, this log over here to the bike if there wouldn't have been pre-planning and if these wouldn't have been here. I know that there are some other ways how to uh, how to put a, a bike lock on the bike, but uh, especially like for for the brakes that we've seen on the previous example, it would be hard if there's nothing pre-planned uh, on the frame. So let's come to software, and in software uh, we will have look at a small example, and the example is from. Uh, the main book uh, behind this course, and it's the book by Ap et al. And in this book, they have an example where they say, uh, okay, we have three different applications here. And these applications are actually very simple and they're very simple on a purpose because we will look at the source code in a minute of those systems. So we have a calculator where we can insert a large expression and then press calculate and then it puts the uh, result into this input box. Uh, then we have ping. This is a, a very great program to check if some other computer node is available or not. So you just put into the uh, IP uh, version 4 uh, IP address over here, uh, and then you get a result uh, also in the text box. And there's a file uploader. And this time we have two buttons, but a very similar, a very different uh, functionality from the domain. But actually, very a lot of commonalities in the source code, because all di dialogues have a similar structure. It's basically always the same layout. We have a text field, and then we have one or two buttons on the right hand side. Uh, they are identical in terms of their main method, in terms of the initialization of windows, of the text field, of the button, uh, the layouting, the window closing and disposal. This is all similar. But there are some positions in the source code where they are different. So, uh, and we mark them here by means of color. We used colors uh, before to, to uh, illustrate uh, the different code. Of course, in practice, you would just have one color of the source code and couldn't recognize where the difference is. So for instance, uh, there's a different label uh, in different of those versions. So it's either calculate or ping, um, as you can see over here. Uh, or the initial um, the initial uh, value of the text in the text field is uh, either the formula or an IP address. And then there's a different label. But you see that there's a lot of code that can actually be reused. And this is why this uh, uh, it's interesting to consider this as a family of dialogues, right? So we've identified some reuse potential um, and we can use plugins to plug in this additional behavior. So what we do now is we look into the source code and we, uh, we will uh, step by step uh, introduce an implementation that allows us, uh, that is very similar to what a framework with plugin does. Uh, and the idea is what we do now is all the behavior that is different for all those different applications, we will put this into a separate plugin. Uh, 
So over here, again, we haven't read our relevant code for this example. So we have a certain exa uh, example plugin. Uh, the plugin needs to be stored because we need to um, yeah, uh, ask the plugin later on at different positions or we'll call some methods. Uh, and we need to inform this plugin about this application because at some point in time it will ask what is the input uh, that I'm supposed to uh, work with. So, and then we basically dele delegate uh, the button text, the initial text, and the application title. We delegate this to a plugin. So, let's look into the plugin implementation. So, the plugin implementation is split into two parts into an actual plugin and into an interface. So, why is that? Yeah, because we want to plug in different plugins, uh, and that's why it's useful to think of this uh, as our family of dialogues has a plugin interface and whoever can uh, work with this interface uh, can provide an, an own plugin that provides all those uh, labels and we see that we have abstract methods here um, that define what needs to be implemented to implement this interface. And then we can be, uh, the basic implementation is straightforward, right? So we just provide our certain data, we have uh, some code hidden here uh, to actually calculate something, uh, but you can see how this how this uh, can work out. The problem with this example, uh, and I might want to go back, is that our application, uh, our plugin, still needs to access the application. Right? So we have this code uh, saying here that uh, uh, inform the plugin where is the application and I need to have this in order to get the input over here, uh, which I will probably call somewhere from this calculate method over here. So what is the problem with this? Um, so far what we achieved is the plugin implementation the calc plugin is hidden from the application. The application only knows the interface plugin yeah, that is used, for instance, over here. But it does not know there's, there's no direct connection to the calc plugin. And the reason why we do this is because we want to ex exchange it and we want to use other plugins also. But what is not yet achieved is that we uh, that the framework also has only particular interface uh, from which it can be accessed, and this will be shown in this example. So the idea here is that not every part of our application can be accessed, but we only provide a certain interface. The interface is called input provider, so that's a new part over here, and it only has one method, uh, get input, and Everything else cannot be seen from the plugin. So the framework, so the left-hand side is basically the framework, and the framework uh, is uh, prohibiting any further access of internal details. So it provides a public API what can be seen from uh, the plugin perspective. So what we did now is that there is communication on both directions. And both can see each other, but both see each other only through an interface. So the application can see the Calc plugin only through the plugin interface, and the Calc plugin can see the application, the framework only through the input provider interface. So this example was very simplified. It shows the main principle uh, behind uh, black box frameworks and plugins, but it's very simplified. And what is simplified? We had a simplification because we said it's just a single extension point. It was sufficient in the small example. Um, and we only had the registration of one single plugin. And the plugin implementation was known at compile time. Um, so, but in practice, we don't, we don't know all the plugins um, in advance. So what we have as typical re requirements from practice is that an extension point typically supports the registration of arbitrary many plugins. Uh, so it can be several plugins for the same extension point. Uh, we have 
a single plugin, which uh, may extend even several extension points. So in this example, we've had one extension point, uh, one uh, uh, and, and several plugins, but still a plugin can even use or make use of several extension points if there are several. And there are, in practice, we will have several extension points. And a plugin may add even add extension points. Uh, so this is, uh, if you hear about this for the first time, this might be a bit confusing. But in principle, many frameworks work in a way that every plugin is able to not only provide extensions for existing extension points, but also provide new extension points that can be then extended by further plugins. And this brings us to something that is kind of a framework of frameworks. And if you uh, go this uh, way further, it could be a framework of framework of framework of frameworks. Uh, and another important point is here that the plugin implementation might not even be available in source code. It might be provided by third party libraries. We have two different uh, concepts uh, that make all this possible. And one is the plugin loader, and the other one is the plugin manager. So the plugin loader is a part of the framework uh, that allows us to identify where are the plugins, uh, to uh, initialize the plugins, to check the dependencies of those plugins uh, at runtime, and test whether uh, a certain file uh, whether a certain uh, extension implements a certain plugin a certain extension point and then there are different uh, approaches depending also on the programming language uh, for instance we have um, dlls uh, uh, when it comes to like c code or so on uh, we have jar files or we might even have particular uh, particular formatted uh, 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 format of XML files, where the XML file specifies what are the dependencies, what is the name of the plugin, what are the extended extension points, and where do I find the source code. And this all helps the plugin loader to load the, the source code, the program, the plugins at runtime. And this is uh, kind of... Uh, and another thing that uh, comes to plugins, which is typically needed if we want to have users reconfiguring the system, then we have a plugin manager. And the manager is uh, often a graphical user interface in which you can add new plugins, in which you can remove plugins, in which you can configure plugins, uh, and even in some cases reload them at runtime. So if you think of a browser, then you can install an ad blocker or you can install some, some other plugins to this browser. And you have an interface typically within the browser where you can add further plugins that you want to install and uh, remove them. And uh, in most of the cases, it will be possible to even uh, load them at runtime. So here's a, a very brief example um, of how the plugin loading and management can, can work. Uh, so this is a very simplified example, but this is a main method in Java. And it could, we could use Java's reflection me mechanism uh, in order to uh, find and identify whether uh, certain, uh, which classes are available. So we could pass them as parameters and then see uh, whether we find a class for that name uh, somewhere in our class path. And then we could see whether this is actually an instance uh, of the plugin interface that we defined earlier. So of course, this is more complicated in practical situations because then we have uh, many extension points. And it's very common to have some format like XML um, to specify which extension points are extended. And then we might want to have handle different plugins uh, for application. And this is why we typically have a list of plugins. And we iterate over this list uh, whenever it comes to initialization, but also when it comes to processing certain messages. So this is very common in, in code where we uh, see, uh, because in, in real world uh, frameworks, we often have multiple plugins available. For instance, one example would be you have an integrated development environment, and this integrated development environment has different 
uh, versioning tools, for instance, support for Git, and it might also have old support for Mercurial or for SVN or things like that. And then you see uh, that there are certain positions where they all need to be initialized, uh, but they also need to be all made available in the same uh, menu um, in the integrated development environment. Speaking of this, um, Eclipse is uh, one of the largest uh, integrated uh, development environments uh, and open source um, uh, environment uh, with many extensions. And those extensions kind of build on each other. And there's a very uh, like a core runtime, which is uh, the, the principal uh, uh, Eclipse uh, core. And this is actually. Um, a plugin itself and then there are further plugins uh, and typically uh, from this picture it would be even larger if we show all the plugins so if you download eclipse you typically have hundreds or even thousands of plugins on your computer and every plugin might provide certain extension points which are then extended for instance um, in in other um, uh, certain extensions provided to other uh, extension points uh, available. So we have lots of common functionality in different IDEs. And the idea of Eclipse was that we can build all these different integrated development environments and can reuse editors, increment a project build, and only need to provide language-specific extensions. Uh, so for instance, the functionality of uh, a certain team plugin like Git. It's probably not written here, but so we could imagine that there's a Git plugin, but it's probably rather independent of whether I'm having editors for Java or for another language. And what is interesting, so if you look at this, um, this recursion uh, over here is that Every plugin can provide new extension points, and those extension points can be then uh, uh, used, uh, and extensions can be provided by other plugins. And uh, what we have is an, a purely declarative um, description of extension points, uh, which in case of uh, Eclipse is certain XML files, for instance, where we write what are extensions and extension points. Uh, if you want to explore how frameworks work uh, in more detail, I want to look, uh, not be confused with all the all the details of Eclipse. Um, we actually have made available in Feature IDE or prototype uh, a very simple plugin loader uh, where you can write your uh, uh, implementation. And there's a hello world framework. It's uh, one of the uh, feature ID examples, and you might want to look into this example because this example shows you that a plugin basically says what are the what does the interface that I'm providing something for. This is the name of the class. This is all the information that is needing needed for the simple plugin manager uh, plugin loader that we implemented over here in order to uh, execute your source code. And this is a simple Hello World program, but it shows and illustrates all the process behind this. So of course, there are, for the examples, there are many different uh, frameworks and black box frameworks available with certain plugins. And we need to be a bit careful uh, when it comes to the work, uh, word framework, because the word framework is often also used for different systems that are not really providing us uh, a black box framework with plugins, but there are some uh, examples here, other IDEs, for instance. I mentioned the example of web browsers already or email clients. Um, so there are different examples where frameworks are used in the wild, and uh, it's kind of one of the standard ways how to implement variable systems. So how does it work? Uh, we want to look again into our pictures. Uh, how can we develop software product lines using frameworks? So the last thing we looked at was service-based implementation in the second part of the lecture. And there we've seen that orchestration and choreography can be used to compose different services. So how is that different for uh, frameworks? 
The idea is again very similar that we have features implemented by different plugins and the feature selection determines which plugins need to be loaded and registered. So this means we have we might have 100 plugins implemented for a product line and if we want to start uh, the framework with a certain subselection then we only put uh, some of those plugins into a particular folder or register them in the integrated uh, in the framework. So this means neither glow code nor explicit service composition is required. So it's kind of the inversion of control means we rather build the general system and then we plug in our uh, components and that's why we don't call it components, we call it plugins. We plug in our plugins into the framework but the framework is reused, right? It's always the same framework and uh, we might have some extended by means of uh, recursive frameworks like frameworks of frameworks but over here the idea is there's no need to write glue code again and again or provide this service orchestration again and again but we rather write the framework once. Of course and as I mentioned, uh, this is my favorite technique to implement product lines. But of course, there's also a downside and the downside comes at a price uh, in terms of the pre-planning problem. We need to know in advance what are possible extension. If a certain extension point to do something is not available, we are simply lost and cannot do anything about it. Right? So all the extension points need to be out there in order for me to uh, apply certain plugins. So we can look at our graph implementation, how this can look with plugins. I will do this very brief over here. Uh, so we can have a list of plugins that are available, that will be registered at some point in time. Then we have certain uh, additional code that needs to be applied whenever we add something. So we want to notify all our plugins that something new is created and added. And then we simply go over all the plugins and notify them uh, whenever something is added or whenever something is uh, printed. And then we can look what uh, the source code does. And uh, if we are, uh, if we have here the printing, then we see that there might be some additional code uh, saying uh, to change the display color uh, whenever we print these nodes. So what about challenges and problems. In our example, we can observe that there are lots of empty methods in the color plugin. And this is very common in practice that uh, there are these iterators over all the plugins. And you ask the first plugin, do you want to do something? No. Then you ask the second plugin, do you want to do something here? No. Then you ask the third plugin. And, and maybe some of the plugins, for some of the methods, they want to actually do something. But we have many methods calls of empty methods, we have many indirections. So the general challenge is that of cross-cutting concerns. Implementing cross-cutting concerns as plugins typically leads to huge interfaces, large parts which are irrelevant for the dedicated plugin and causes lots of communication over it within uh, plugins and frameworks. So we will talk about cross-cutting concerns in the next lecture in more detail, how to implement this uh, maybe in better ways. And if we were not familiar with a graph library, would we anticipate that colors and weights should be part of the plugin interface? Right? Should we have, would we anticipate that we need a method and we need to call every plugin uh, that a new node is added? So and every plugin needs to be notified that the framework is about to print a node or edge. So this requires pre-planning. This is known as a pre-planning problem. And uh, it's hard to identify and foresee what is relevant, which hotspots do I need, what is the nature of extensions, how uh, of future extensions, what are good extension points for my framework. And that's the hardest part of this requires a lot of expertise and that's why a good successful framework cannot be implemented by someone who is not really uh, into the domain already and it's typically designed by people with lots of expertise and excellent domain knowledge. To wrap up the last part of the lecture, the framework is open to extensions uh, by integrating plugins at explicit hotspots. So hotspots are 
pre-planned extension points that can be then later on used by plugins to plug in to provide their extensions. The framework takes full control over the execution. Uh, the framework decides when to call which plugin at all time and enables full automation but requires pre-planning effort. So we, we achieved our goal of features, we can implement features, we can implement compile time variability, we can automate based on a feature selection which uh, product is built with compile time variability but with two limitations. One is that the features need to be modularized in terms of plugins and uh, we need to pre-plan all the possible extensions and that's why a product line where a product line can help. So uh, for the practical part, I uh, thought it would be interesting to think about for the possible extension for a bike and think about which of those bike extensions affected, are affected by the pre-planning problem. Right? So there might be things that you can easily put into the bike and there might be others that are hard. So one example that might be hard is to make a bike uh, yeah, or give it a, a, a new engine uh, if the engine was not uh, investigate before and I did this yesterday in my lecture and I asked them uh, to decorate my bike so they the students thought of different um, extensions to my bike <clears throat> but overall it turned out that uh, there are some extensions that are easier to do than others and you might imagine that there are some extensions uh, that need that require some pre-planning in order to apply them and also a common problem in practice that you have many if you have many extensions then at some point in time the framework approach will not work that good anymore thank you for your attention and hope to see you again in one of the next lectures goodbye